Well, a very good evening, everybody. It's uh, Jordan Bridge, Deputy CFI at Lasham here with Meteorology Part One to talk about the uh, the wonderful world of meteorology, something that the British do take a little bit in their stride. Um, that music you heard just to begin with there, Sailing By by Ronald Binge. Um, some of you might wonder, why is Jordan putting classical music on? Well, the reason I'm doing that is because that piece of music is very famous indeed for being linked to the shipping forecast, probably the um, the most additional forecast there is and the uh, most British one there is. Aviation doesn't really have that version of forecast, but uh, we'll nick that from the sailors for today. Um, so today we're going to talk about how we interpret meteorology. Um, I'm not a qualified meteorologist myself, sort of learnt on the job really working at Lasham and uh, especially in the new era that we're in with uh, social distancing, we're having to do it all by webinar, a bit like this. So this is the first part of a two part series. Um, the reason for that is because it's actually quite difficult to get everything into one presentation. So I'm hoping that tonight should only last about 90 minutes and then we'll go on to something more uh, it, not more interesting, but a bit more detailed um, come the next session, more on sort of hazardous weather and uh, lapse rates and stuff like that. So we'll keep you in trust today by sort of varying things a little bit and sort of finishing off next week, next Saturday. But as I was saying, gliding forecast in the new normal. Um, you can see here we're using uh, sort of our lashing page and we do a forecast every day at nine o'clock and uh, 9.30 during the summer. Uh, we, and that's how we're doing it. We're not getting people around in big circles because if you have 100 people on a webinar, 100 people, sorry, um, uh, sort of gathering around a clubhouse, it doesn't really work at a big club. So the actual way of doing it now is done by YouTube, but that doesn't mean that the forecasting changes at all. So AIMS introductions to meteorology part one. Um, we're going to look and be able to relate to the behavior of global weather systems to soaring weather and relate that soaring weather to the local topography and forecast conditions and make decisions leading to the safe and successful flight you'll see here that we've got uh, our general topics uh, atmosphere pressure winds and air masses and fronts are what we're going to look at today there might be a bit of overlap but going into uh, next week we'll look at fog mist and haze humidity lapse rates and precipitation and other hazardous conditions so yes just sort of breaking it down a little bit so that you're not uh, getting sort of too frazzled in a three-hour webinar which would have been the alternative i think if we hadn't done it this way so we start with the atmosphere um Let's get the make sure that's working. Yeah, the atmosphere is the term given to the layer of air which surrounds Earth and extends upwards from the surface to about 500 miles and can be considered as four different layers. Pressure falls steadily at, with heights, but temperature uh, pressure falls steadily with heights, but temperature also falls just steadily to the tropopause, where then in the stratosphere the temperature starts to increase again before decreasing in the mesosphere and then once again in the thermosphere. Now you might wonder why is it so odd? Why does it vary so much? Well that's mostly linked to the sort of gases that are in the atmosphere at different points. In the troposphere it's fairly uh, it's fairly simple, it, everything just cools with heights, but in the stratosphere there's more ozone present and that ozone um, sort of absorbs a lot of the sunlight and it, that gives off heat. There's no ozone in the mesosphere, uh, but in the thermosphere, there's some more oxygen, some more ozone. So again, the temperature gets really hot in there. I'd actually say more hot than uh, it is down here. Um, as I say, the troposphere goes up to about 10 kilometers, and that's the area that we're most interested in, because that's where most of the gliding happens. Um, it sometimes does happen that we do go gliding more into the stratosphere, but you're only really doing that if you're flying above uh, sort of 30,000 feet, which has been done in gliders, and it's certainly been done by the Perlan project who aim to get to 100,000 feet. But uh, for what we're doing, we're really generally interested in the troposphere. So that's what we're going to focus on most today. Um, down where we are, we generally have the air above us that is giving a general pressure of about 1,013 hectopascals, which is known as the International Standard Atmosphere. And that's what we're going to have a look at a little bit later as well. And yeah, I think that's all I've got on the atmosphere at the moment. But going on to global circulation, we start with sort of the big picture on how weather works, but we focus a little bit more on what it's like at a sort of more local level. Just for information as well, I don't actually, I don't believe have any, oh no, I do have 
the chat as well. So fantastic. Uh, everybody can see the presentation. Good, superb. Uh, I think, yeah, nobody else has said that they can't see the presentation. That's good, just checking. So as I say, we start having just look at the general overview of what happens on the planet, and then we'll sort of zoom in a bit into what happens in the UK. So global circulation. Well, with that, the combination of the Earth's tilt and its curved surface means that the equatorial regions, the area around the equator, and if I get my pen, my laser pointer, the areas around the, laser, the um, equator, they get more direct sunlight for most of the year, and hence more surface heating from the sun. This heating causes convection, which we will learn about a little bit later, but within the atmosphere, this results in circular motion of air, which uh, enables the less dense air to rise and be replaced by uh, cooler, denser air. This warm air does flow towards the poles, both in the north and the south, where it cools, sinks, becomes denser and sinks back towards the surface. As it says here, the UK does become very much under the influence of these seasonals. Um, and depending on the location of where these cells are really does matter to what weather conditions we get. And we're going to have a look at something called the polar front. This polar front, which sort of uh, uh, sort of segregates the warmer, more tropical air towards Africa and the more Arctic air uh, towards the North Pole, sort of controls our climate quite a lot as the UK sort of moves from one side of it to the other quite often. And of course, at the moment, it's very cold. We're in that polar air. The UK does get that influence from the sort of more tropical high that we get, um, but not as much as places like France. We don't see sort of the 40 degrees and stuff like that that sort of Spain and France see. So our sort of very uh, more northerly uh, situation where we are in the world does mean that we are generally colder, wetter and a little bit more damper. So as it says, these areas do move about all the time and the greatest heating really is dependent for where the planet is at the time, depending on its tilt. So obviously we're going to be much nicer in summer and that's why we go gliding in the summer. But linked in with this quite interesting effect is the Coriolis effect as well. The Coriolis effect um, is caused by the rotation of the Earth, because if you imagine if it was just to stand still, everything would generally flow in a straight line. To us stood on Earth, we don't really notice the Coriolis effects because we travel fairly uh, short distances and fairly slowly compared to what the speed of the Earth's rotation is. But the Coriolis effect does significantly affect sort of bodies like um, weather, not so much water, that's, that's really down to the moon, but the Northern Hemisphere generally causes the Coriolis effect to affect air towards the right, causing it to fill, uh, follow a curved path instead of a straight line. The degree of deflection depends on the latitude, uh, so of course we're quite far up, uh, so we are more at risk of being sort of under the effect of the Coriolis effect more than if you were down in, let's say, Singapore or at the equator, where really this effect is at zero. Quite often this is also linked to being um, sort of in baths and plug holes and stuff like that. It's very loosely linked, I won't go into it too much detail, but um, if you think about which way the plug hole goes in uh, sort of Australia compared to the UK, it is sort of linked to that. But uh, I, I've been told that there is a bit of urban myth uh, compared to uh, what actually the baths are doing. And I think in The Simpsons, once they even showed a way to get a toilet, which uh, just sucks everything straight. So, uh, yes, we won't uh, rely too much on bathtubs. But, uh, yeah, the Coriolis effect does have a huge impact on our weather. And being where we are in the UK, it certainly does. And that link uh, leads us to pressure as well. The atmospheric pressure is the force exerted by the weight above us. Uh, we generally measure this in hectopascals. This uh, has caused a bit of debate over the years about what's the difference and stuff. Um, I'm not particularly too sure of the exact reasons of why it's switched to hectopascals. I think it may have been us moving to more of a uh, SI unit as such within the science world. But for all intensive purposes, a hectopascal is the same as a millibar. Um, and that uh, has to be sort of averaged out. And as we spoke about initially, 
uh, the ICAO standard atmosphere uh, is about 1,013 hectopascals. And that's sort of regardless of the local conditions. And we'll come on to why that, that pressure is important a little bit later. Pressure reduces generally, at least for the first 5,000 foot of the atmosphere, by about one hectopascal per 30 feet. Um, and we use the altimeter to look at different pressure settings which are relevant to the flying we're doing. So generally when we're flying cross-country in gliders or maybe long distance in powered aeroplanes, we're looking to be on Q&H and that represents the altitude above mean sea level. That can be attained by getting what is the pressure from the mean sea level. Well, there's many ways to do that, but generally air traffic control and the Met Office and stuff use different reporting stations across the UK, which will give that mean pressure setting. QFE, uh, field elevation, is the pressure from the point above ground. So generally when we're flying circuits at gliding clubs or maybe in the circuit at a powered airfield, there's uh, we generally use QFE, but bear in mind that airspace is always worked out in altitudes rather than above height. So yeah, generally for, it's useful to be on QNH as much as we can when we're not in the local area. The scale is also set, as I said, to 1013 when we look at flight levels, and I'll bring a bit more of a graphic into that in a moment. But linking on from pressure, we need to look at the two types, high and low pressure. Think about the atmosphere is always trying to equalise this pressure. Areas of high and low pressures are caused by ascending and descending air. As air cools, it eventually falls, leading to high pressure at the surface and suppression of most of the bad weather conditions that we get. However, high pressure, though people link it mostly to good weather, isn't always the case. That's because sometimes you get a bit of moisture trapped below an inversion, which we'll learn about in next week's lesson. And with that inversion, sometimes all of that moisture gets trapped and it can either become fog, low cloud, and that's what's called a dirty high colloquially. You won't see it sort of on a map labelled as a dirty high, but high pressures for most of the time with that subsiding air will bring fair conditions. But just be aware that if you get a moisture track off sort of the North Sea and stuff, it can be a little bit uh, more uh, sort of foggy and murky. But when air warms, it rises and leads to low pressure at the surface, which given the fact uh, the air is trying to reach the equilibrium, br brings in circulating in increasingly stronger winds to move inwards and upwards. As the air continues to ascend, it cools and associated with, associated with it fronts, leading to the formation of clouds and precipitation. And you can sort of see the difference between convergence, which I was just discussing there about stuff coming in with low pressures, compared to uh, high pressure where stuff diverges. Uh, convergence is obviously sometimes good for us in, in gliders. We enjoy soaring up and down convergence lines, but we'll have a look at sort of different bits about convergence because not necessarily is everything um, uh, is the definition they're using always what we're after when we're looking to go soaring. So in this case, it's just air that is converging rather than a really, really good soaring day coming up. And you can see here a better, a slightly better graphic with um, what's going on in the picture above. But so uh, yeah, high and low pressure is really important in what we're doing. And when we are uh, sort of flying, um, if, especially if we're doing long cross-country flights, and there was a famous one done by Gordon MacDonald about 15 to 20 years ago in the Fandy Darlington down from a Boyne down to Lasham, uh, you may end up flying through sort of different bits of uh, sort of high and low pressure. You might have a high centred over the top of Scotland and a low uh, towards the English Channel. This can cause a bit of a problem because if you stay on the same altimeter setting, it will overread um, high when flying towards a low, or underread low when flying towards a high. But all the time, high pressure is always looking to equalize, and as such, the process is never complete. This air is always, always moving about, and you can never quite stop it. And if it did stop, then we wouldn't really have weather, and probably we wouldn't be able to live either because we wouldn't have any crops or plants or anything like that. So it's a good thing all this happens. But the jet stream is very important too because where we are in the UK 
as we you probably saw on a map earlier about sort of different winds and trade winds and stuff like that we are situated on the edge of the atlantic of course and a lot of our weather is driven by that jet stream that jet stream is the boundary between the polar front and the warmer air to the south of it. This is a constant battleground between uh, sort of cold and warm air, and it's being fought out there pretty hard at the moment. Um, I mean, there's talk of, again, another cold spell, potentially temperatures well below freezing in some areas of the country later into next week. And that's just this battleground between the warm and cold air really fighting it out. Sometimes you'll get a kink in this um, uh, in the jet stream, as you can see here, that can allow high pressure areas to form and can also sort of stop weather patterns from uh, uh, from moving about. So that can uh, lead to a bit more settled conditions or it can trap stuff with us. So um, not always does the jet stream sort of flow completely straight, but as I say, complete battleground between the two sides. And uh, the jet stream position also moves up and down, as I was saying with uh, earlier uh, during the summer it's generally towards the south of us but come august time always seems around competitions especially the junior nationals this uh, starts to start creeping its way up north and again if we get trapped right underneath that jet stream it's like a conveyor belt of con conveyor belt of these uh, low pressure systems so yeah pretty tricky indeed when we do get under those and hopefully come march when hopefully we're allowed to fly again we'll get some nice settled high pressure and some good soaring. But yeah, that's jet stream. Also to note about jet stream um, is uh, it can increase the, uh, the speeds that you can travel at, uh, especially in commercial airliners. If you're coming across from New York to London, I think the record done by a 747 was just about five hours compared to about eight or nine going the other way. So though for glider pilots, the jet stream isn't making too much of a difference um, with sort of winds at height. For the airline pilots, it certainly does make a difference for them and uh, massive fuel savings can be made. And uh, you can generally see on the weather charts when we do have the jet stream over us, because sometimes on our local forecasts, you can see at 24,000 feet, You've got wind speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. Uh, not particularly good for wave soaring. You would uh, certainly burn away with that. Um, as I was saying, uh, land mass, Coriolis effect, and seasons generally influence the seasons. Okay. I'll just put this one in here. Um, density altitude, mostly because um, it doesn't necessarily fit into one particular area. It is linked with temperature, but there's not too much to say about temperature in this week. But um, I'm currently doing the, the new flying instructor motor glider course um, to teach for the BGA syllabus. And one area which potentially in gliding we don't look at enough is density altitude. Um, this can affect not just big heavy jets, but winch launching, aero towing, it can affect a lot of things. And on a hot and humid day, an aircraft will generally accelerate more slowly down the runway and will need to move faster to obtain the same lift and will climb more slowly. This is because the air is less dense and therefore there's less lift and it's more lethargic to get the airplane into the air. In sort of higher climates, um, when we sort of talk about in mountainous regions, potentially the engine is also not getting as much uh, air as it really needs to produce full power. So that can also reduce in reduced propell propeller efficiency and reduce net thrust, all of which increases the amount of takeoff run that we need. And by not taking density altitude into, into account, we can get to a situation where potentially, even on a long airfield, and I know that this, this has happened in sort of South Africa, Namibia, places like that, you, you need a long way to get airborne. But this does affect the UK. I mean, I've just put in a uh, an example here uh, with Sutton Bank, um, at, which is a high club in the sort of the north of England. If you get 35 degrees, probably quite unlike for the northerners to get that, but it could happen. And sort of a, a sort of medium Q and H, probably soarable uh, with 1020. It can go from feeling like 900 feet to the air feeling like three and a half thousand feet. And certainly at Lasham, and we're, we're only at 600 feet above sea level, we notice takeoff rolls get considerably longer, especially uh, if we're going uphill with the density altitude to affect as well. So, yeah, uh, 
there's quite a lot to read into density altitudes. So don't sort of just take it as what I'm saying is the only thing. There are calculations and stuff, which is probably a bit much for this presentation, which is trying to be as concise as possible. But do have a read into it. It is important for glider pilots and um, uh, and and power pilots alike. Um, helicopters as well. I guess it affects them in some ways, but uh, I haven't really done much helicopter flying, so uh, I wouldn't be able to say. But the International Standard Atmosphere is that common reference um, which has been established. The, this is sort of saying, what is the average on planet Earth? So a pressure of 1013, a temperature of 15 degrees, and a density um, of that. Um, in the aircraft handbooks, especially powered aircraft handbooks, uh, 15 degrees will be in there um, as some of the takeoff calculations or landing distance calculations, etc. So um, that's why it's done, because uh, the International Standard Atmosphere is sort of that baseline figure. Obviously, um, the UK's climate especially can vary in how what the pressure is. We can have very intense highs of a thousand and forty but also very intense lows of uh, nine fifty hectopascals and things like that so although uh, the UK does move about quite a lot the international standard atmosphere is the same everywhere and uh, does help a lot because as we move on to altimetry we have to look again at the different things that are occurring uh, as we spoke about before We've got QNH, which is the altitude above the mean sea level. We've got QFE, which is the height above ground level. And then you would deduce from that what the elevation is as well. But then we come on to flight levels. And most of the time when flying in the south of the UK, flight levels don't particularly matter. Only flying a powered aircraft, it might not matter even more. And I know in America, the transition level is uh, quite high up. But there is this layer. In, in aviation called the transition layer. It's just beneath it is the transition altitude and just above it is the transition level. The transition layer is um, effectively the points where people are changing from the Q&H that they're probably on onto the flight levels. And this generally starts at the transition altitude because this is the point where controllers are more interested in, they're going into sectors where aircraft are starting to travel much, much further distances. And if they were constantly having to change their pressure, they would all potentially be at different heights and it's not particularly safe. So once we get in the south of the UK, generally above 6,000 feet in the UK, um, it gets to a... Um, it gets to a stage where everybody goes, right, OK, 1,013 hexapascals. That's what we're all on. And everybody then knows they are all at the same flight level. And this is important for glider pilots, because when we are going flying in wave, really, when, once we get to uh, sort of 6,000, 7,000, we need to start thinking if the, the, the rules say that we should go to flight levels, uh, just in case if you're speaking, let's say, a boy into maybe Scottish control or something like that. They aren't particularly interested in what your altitude is because they don't necessarily know what pressure setting you're on, how reliable that is. If they've got a, a commercial aircraft which is traveling through that bit of class E or, or sort of class G airspace that is shared between uh, people, they want to know exactly where you are so they can deconflict. So that flight level is really important. The transition uh, level is the lowest flight level available for use above the uh, transition altitude. So it's not as if they will stick somebody right in this layer, um, this transition layer as such, uh, because they do accept there is a bit of a margin. Um, so, yeah, you won't get that too much. But, uh, yeah, take into account that flight levels are really important and uh, have a look on your map as well. Navigation goes into this a little bit more, but there are areas generally above 6,000 feet where the flight level is really important because if it's on a high pressure day, um, that the amount of space you have to fly in will change quite significantly. Um, and if it's low pressure, inversely. So yeah, make sure that you are on the right pressure setting for what you are wishing to do. And it's always 30 foot per hectopascal conversion uh, to get between them. Oh, I put some forgot about that. Ah, one more thing. Um, sometimes you'll see 
uh, sort of something called a regional pressure setting, especially if you're speaking to a, a fairly broad air traffic unit such as London Information, which is uh, which sort of covers anything across the country, which doesn't really have anywhere else to go. An airliner won't generally speak to London Information, and if you listen to my communication lecture, you hear a little bit more about what they do. But somewhere like that will use a regional pressure setting, which is effectively the lowest Q and H, the lowest pressure. Um, in the area uh, so there's there's lots and lots of different areas that split up you've got sort of places like Wessex you, you've sort of got down places down towards Dover and uh, and sort of Weymouth etc and all of these areas will have a regional pressure setting which is the lowest forecast pressure uh, that is due in the next hour or so so um, be aware that if you are on a regional pressure setting instead of one of these that uh, as you get closer to airspace again you might want to change back to a more uh, relevant q &H because otherwise you may end up bumping into airspace so quite a complex subject altimetry um, Again, there could be an entire separate lecture on this. So um, I would suggest that you generally go uh, through this. I can see Greg's talked about Q&E. I do hear about q and &E. I don't hear it so much in gliding comps anymore. Um, I think at one point Q&E was used quite religiously, but uh, those that flew a little bit more before my time might be able to tell me a little bit more about where Q&E was used. So, uh, yes. And as John says, uh, the transition altitude does vary with the pressure. Um, when you get really low pressures uh, like you've got at the moment, there's often no terms of warnings about that sort of ch says uh, that if you are uh, taking off from an airfield which is in an area of really really low pressure then there is a risk that uh, there could be level busts or uh, level bust is when you go past your assigned sort of flight level where the controller wants you to go so um, caution is taken quite uh, quite a lot when there are uh, sort of big variations from the international standard atmosphere to the high pressures and the low pressures so uh, yes um, as John says, not in NOTAM, but on ATIS. I have seen it on NOTAMs. Um, as I say, they, I don't know why it's in there, but I think it's an FIR NOTAM, but uh, I do I do occasionally see them in there. Um, but it's not for everywhere. It's probably something that the uh, London TMA does uh, just to be helpful. On to wind. As we said, um, wind is sort of going hand in hand with pressure trying to equalize. Our prevailing wind direction in the UK, due to the dominance of the Atlantic and the jet stream, et cetera, is, um, is east-west. Make sure I've got my, yeah, still got that. Um, uh, is is, is east-west. Um, and that's why runways are generally built in such a direction as well. Uh, other than Birmingham, for some reason, that for some reason, if there's anybody that's worked at Birmingham, something like that, can tell me why their runway is northwest or north south. Um, then, then yes, but most runways in the UK were built during the war to be east west, just to take advantage of that uh, prevailing wind direction. And I know for clubs that are based on a north south airfield, that can be quite tricky for winch launching. As we said earlier, air movements are deflected to the right due to the Coriolis effect and a generally anti-clockwise rotation around a low in the northern hemisphere, because remember everything is opposite in the southern hemisphere. Clockwise rotation around a high. And we'll come on to pressure gradient force in a moment, but there's Bayes Ballot Law. Um, I, I'm told it's actually folklore that uh, this chap actually invented it. It was actually somebody else and he got the name for it or whatever. But regardless of the name, um, if you stand with your back to the wind, the low pressure system in the northern hemisphere will be on your left. So generally, because most low pressure systems go through the top of sort of Scotland, that's where you're going to find uh, uh, the low pressure system. And that's that, that works quite well. Um, Pressure gradient forces, we were saying, the air is moving from high to low pressure. And as we look at synoptic charts a little bit later, we'll learn a bit more about pressure gradients and the fact that um, the, the, with low pressure systems, you go from some sort of a reasonable high pressure and very, very quickly it steps down towards the low and the tighter those isobars uh, on the charts are, and the isobars we'll look at too, um, the sort of the stronger the wind and the stronger that pressure gradient. And that's where we sort of start to see storms and uh, particularly difficult weather conditions. But isobars, as I'm about to show on the next slide, 
um, are defined as lines on the map uh, on the chart, uh, synoptic chart, joining equal pressure. So you can see on here, a little bit small, but you can see all of these lines that are sort of going around uh, the low pressure system here. This, so you can see 1024, that will swing all the way around. I think it sort of disappears up here. And you can see that really, really tight pressure gradient you've got here. This is quite a deep low for the, uh, for the UK, 942. Generally, um, as uh, low pressure systems get towards the UK, they do sort of give off a little bit. They don't generally arrive quite that ferociously on the UK because stuff like this would probably see winds in probably excess of about 50 to 60 miles an hour at generally across the country, let alone at, at coasts. Um, but yeah, the tighter they are, generally the steeper the pressure gradient and the stronger the wind. And sort of zooming out a little bit will give you just an idea on the uh, um, as you can see here, just give you a bit of an idea on a slightly more regular pressure day, just how sort of gradual it can be. And when we look at the synoptic chart, sometimes the isobars are really, really spread out and we get really, really light winds. But uh, unfortunately, not as much as we would like to really get in the UK. But uh, yeah, isobars very, very useful. And we'll look at a little bit more about these symbols on the chart shortly. Surface wind. Um, surface wind is generally measured at about 10 meters above the ground um, this sort of gives the most uninterrupted view of what's going on close to the ground if, if, if something is mounted very close to the ground it, the topography even within a few meters might change how much the wind's influencing um, the readings so yeah surface wind at airfields is generally measured at about 10 meters um, let's say height of a double decker bus or or, or, or a few um, but yeah that's generally where you got everything mounted on a pole at an airfield um, and the the surface does however effectively create a drag both naturally and by human influence and when I say human influence we're talking about stuff like buildings um, trees well they're not really our influence but nature's influence um, uh, sort of constructions. I mean, uh, London's a great example. You're not going to get a particularly good surface wind reading in the middle of London. And forecasts are, are done, I think, fairly cleverly. I'm not quite sure how they they do it in in the middle of London, but they do seem to work out how uh, that this surface wind's going to get affected by uh, by sort of more built up area. But everybody generally says airfields are really really windy places, and that's it goes without saying because there's less of these sort of natural influences and also human influences to get in our way but the surface friction is quite important and this gets a little bit complicated um because if we didn't have surface friction and there wasn't any of this then well everything would sort of go in a straight line and wind would be fairly constant there wouldn't be any gusts there wouldn't be um, it, it, yeah everything would be quite easy to predict but where we get down to where we're flying um below generally three thousand feet uh the surface wind and the effects of these um, influences of buildings and such really do become important because these buildings slow down the air, they force it down different sort of channels, um, not natural for the wind to do so. So wind speeds close to the ground are generally less than would be expected um, from what you can see here. And um, when this does happen, um, the Coriolis effect uh, does start to sort of play a bit of a balancing game for the pressure gradient force as well. Uh, you can see the Coriolis effect does have uh, does have some sort of force here, but generally, uh, as we get uh, sort of towards the uh, the ground, this will have sort of the upper hand, and we'll start to see the wind back. And when I say back, that means it's it's sort of going anti-clockwise rather than clockwise. Um, so the wind starts to blow across these isobars um, into the centre of the low pressure. It's sort because of, the air is wanting to equalise, and it does sort of go the opposite way in a high pressure. But then you're not really getting such strong winds, so it's not so much. I don't think of a problem. Um, the Coriolis effect, as I say, does have a, an effect of it, um, but the the wind direction does change as we get higher. It does start to sort of uh, become a little bit more like this one on the left. Um, 
so yeah once you're above sort of 3,000 feet it can become uh, quite easy to predict what's going to happen unless you're starting to get sort of air masses that are meeting and that's a story for a little bit later um, but uh, even though um, you will have a general idea of what's going on um, in the local area it doesn't always sort of work like that sort of local conditions based off sort of hills and uh, mountains sort of large features of water and stuff may change this further so um this is very much sort of site specific knowledge when it comes down to your gliding club especially if you're at a hill, hill site you'll know exactly what the wind's going to do um but yes if you sort of take away from this that um uh that uh, sort of near the surface things will slow and turn inwards across the ice bars and with height the winds will increase and veer you won't go too far wrong and when we look at sort of the exam papers that's what it's sort of asking you it's not asking you to sort of label all the forces because this that this is quite a lot of stuff and even i've had to uh, try and get my head around a lot of what's going on here because it's uh, it is very scientific but uh, very cool for what nature tries to do but uh, yeah, everything is trying to balance itself. And that is really uh, what weather is after all. Wind and aviation from a more practical point. Um, you'll hear something called, uh, trying to pronounce it, diurnal variation or something like that. And this can be seen um, sort of quite prominently throughout uh, places across the world where as the sun sort of heats the ground and the sort of thermal stop getting kicked off, you start to get turbulence in the lower levels. And this sort of turbulence will start to uh, cause gusts and it will sort of start to influence the wind a little bit more. Sometimes if you've got sort of no pressure systems, uh, or cold fronts, warm fronts, anything near you, this is the only thing that's really driving uh, sort of the wind at, at sort of the surface. So, um, yeah, during the day, the wind will generally increase and um, it will generally, uh, yeah, it, it will generally increase. Um, especially when it gets to a day where it's already be quite windy let's say 20 knots it's quite easy to go out and go right okay let's go gliding but by midday the gusts probably off the scale they're probably 35 40 knots and i've put in from the bj instructor manual um this little ex uh, extert of a um extract of a uh accident report which is in the instructor manual and it sort of talks about what might happen if you do not really take this uh, diurnal variation uh, variation into account? A tongue twister, that is. Um, so yeah, take, do take that into account because uh, it is important, and that sort of allows the wind to increase during the day. But as everything starts to calm down, the thermals get uh, a bit quieter in the evenings. All of that starts to sort of go away as such. So sometimes flying at evenings is the best. And this is the real reason why balloons go flying at uh, sort of times in the day uh, away from uh, the centre, not just because of thermals, but to keep away from these fairly strong and turbulent winds. Um, what's too windy? Um, well, in a glider, we, it depends where you are. The Mind, I've seen them flying 40 knots. Um, a place like Lasham, once it starts gusting above 30 knots, it starts becoming a bit tricky. Generally, it's actually the ground handling, which is the tricky bit for uh, aeroplanes. Uh, once you're in the air, OK, you might end up being blown backwards or something like that. But it's unlikely that you're going to end up in a situation um, where the aeroplanes can lose control and crash unless you've really flown to a hurricane or something. So, yeah, the ground handling is where aircraft generally get more damaged um, uh, and stuff. And we'll look at uh, wind corrosions and wind shears next. But, uh, yeah, so always using sort of care and also with crosswinds as well remembering that generally for a lot of aircraft there's no such thing as a crosswind limit there's only a demonstrated crosswind um, that might be what the manufacturer says is really sensible um, but uh, one not over one not under just you've got to take it on your experience level on the site and stuff like that it's not really easy enough just to say right okay we're one not over the crosswind limits we can't go flying or we're two knots under we're at a really uh, sort of uh, exposed site it'll be okay so uh, yeah do sort of know your airplane when you are looking to go flying because uh, what's too windy for one might uh, be okay for another just double check 
Let's keep going on at the moment. You can see we're all still talking about uh, uh, Q and E and QFE at the moment. Um, QFE is the height above the highest. Daniel talks about uh, the highest point above the reporting airfield. Uh, airfield reference point is generally what I say. Um, I don't necessarily think the airfield reference points is the at least that my airfield is the highest point because if you have a hill in the corner would that mean that that's the point uh, i'll have to have a look um but so uh, yeah i can see we're, uh, we're we're sort of having a debate on that one <laughs> but, uh, i'll leave that for the moment um wind gradients and wind shear um so I've sort of put it into more graphical sort of representation. Um, this is quite important in gliders because we don't have another opportunity to go around. Um, if we start an approach at 60 knots um, going into wind, and if that, if the wind starts to reduce close to the ground, which as we say with surface, uh, surface wind, it will. Um, if we just keep that speed at the same, you'll see the airspeed will eventually start creeping down. Now, if you're in a K21 where the minimum landing speed is about 50 knots, you won't really want to be at 42 knots at about 100, 200 feet above the ground because you might not have, especially at max all up weight, enough elevator authority to actually flare. So make sure you are uh, keeping a speed up all the way down because otherwise it will catch you out and uh, over the years there's been plenty of accidents and stuff like that and uh, it's nothing new particularly um there is the threat of stuff like curl over and clutching hand effect as well curl over generally caused by uh, stuff like trees and buildings I said before where that uh, that air, that air which is uh, having to deal with the surface friction is hitting stuff and is rolling over and causing a lot of turbulence across the airfield there's also clutching hand effects which um, sort of follows a generally similar principle but it may happen as well if we're looking at areas which are a hill site if you're having to do an approach over something uh, a bit of land which is in lee of the hill then potentially there's going to be sink on top of that as well as the as the wind goes over the hill and starts going down the slope uh, so yeah curl over and clutching hand effect are, are, are quite um, noticeable issues that we must uh, keep our eye on when we're flying and the best way to keep an eye on with that is to use the appropriate speeds um, generally um, sort of in a k21 it's something like uh, 50 knots plus half the wind speed or something like that will work uh, as sort of a rough figure but uh, if you're going to sites such as Denby um, that's somewhere where you need to sort of ask somebody like Chris for a bit of advice on what he says uh, is uh, applicable for the day because I know certainly on their southwesterly run they do get quite a clutching hand effect this is when you might need to increase the airspeed further on approach up to sort of 70 or 80 knots so I'd say if we're sort of getting um, to a point where you're sort of having to put the speed up beyond 80 knots uh, probably we shouldn't be going gliding it's probably a little bit too breezy because once you come to a stop you're going to be uh, dealing with a lot of wind on the ground um as we spoke about earlier with the uh, changes in wind direction um wind gradients can in some circumstances be quite um severe especially if you have as we'll come on to next week a uh, an inversion um you can get quite a marked change in the wind direction and uh, if we're winch launching for example and we know that's uh, that's there if you're the first person to take the cable up uh, for the day you might be surprised that you might end up drifting a slightly different way to what you thought about looking at the uh, at the windsock and that's why there's it's very useful at times to actually have a bit of a look at the ballooning forecast as well on the met office because that sort of shows where those inversions are and where the wind direction may be actually quite out from what it is on the ground but uh, normally by the time we get into the day as we talk about with diurnal variation uh, there's not so much of a problem um, with uh, absolutely horrendous changes in, in direction. That is unless you're near a storm and um, something that we'll focus on next week is gust fronts and microbursts and stuff like that because uh, really all the uh, rules of weather go out the window when uh, you, you have that because storms are very unpredictable. But wind shear, generally not noticeable above 3,000 feet and uh, yeah sort of trying to keep stable on the approach is is quite a key thing and as a glider pilot we don't really have an option to go around so uh, yeah airspeed is is key here 
Also notes with um, windsocks. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to tell me that uh, uh, that not all windsocks are like this, and I know they're not. But um, if you buy a, a proper windsock, not just something you get down from an air show stand, uh, windsocks are calibrated. Um, they're put in wind tunnels and stuff to see at what angle that will allow a uh, the wind sort of to be accurately shown. And at 20 knots, as you can see, for a sock that we've got last year, um, it's going to be straight, uh, sort of horizontal. For sort of 15 knots, it might be a bit more flappy, and uh, five knots, it, it, it just means that somebody who's flying, who maybe doesn't have a control or anything else to help, does have a fighting chance in being able to, uh, being able to work out uh, what the wind is on the ground. So very useful. And uh, all I'll say is, is that uh, if you have been away for a cross-country flight and you don't know what the surface wind is, do have a look as you're as you're approaching, because I've had at least once in Australia where the wind's done a full 180 uh, because of uh, local conditions that have changed or a thunderstorm that's been nearby. So uh, as much as they might just seem like a legislative necessity, a windsock is very, very good. Okay. Looking at thermals, advection and convection. There's a couple of definitions to learn here. Advection is the horizontal transport or transfer of a, a quantity, I think that's supposed to read, um, such as heat or, or coal and cold uh, from one point to another. So that's sort of uh, one thing. But convection, which is more what we see in uh, for uh, for gliding, but what we're really interested in is the vertical transport and mixing of the heat and other properties of a fluid through a mass motion. Um, and yeah, it's generally taken to imply uh, vertical motion. Thermals, well, I'm hoping for the glider pilots here, we don't really need to uh, explain that in too much detail. Um, I put some uh, sort of uh, photos here, thanks to uh, Steve Longland, uh, who is a very, very good artist um, with his graphical skills that he's got uh, to produce some of these diagrams. Um, one thing of note with convection, um, which has always fascinated me, has been the fact that convection can happen at night. And it um, that's not necessarily linked to stuff that's happening on the ground. Um, sort of warm air and sort of convection can still happen in the upper layers of the atmosphere at night and trigger thunderstorms because ultimately thunderstorms are running on the energy of convection to keep them going. So a thunderstorm at four in the morning or even at the moment, I think in Hampshire there was talk on the news of some thunder snow where you get a little bit of lightning um, happen uh, at the same time as uh, uh, as it's snowing, well, it's it's hardly uh, particularly convective by the sun uh, at that time. So that comes on to sort of the stability of air, air masses as well. But uh, yeah, it doesn't necessarily rely just on the sun to cause convection. And uh, certainly when we look at the clouds, um, you don't necessarily need a, a bright blue sky to get the best thermal conditions. We know that stability tells us that that is not necessarily the best conditions compared to when you might have a, a fairly blanket overcast and you might still have thermals. So uh, stability is, has a lot to do with uh, thermals and we'll go into that in detail a bit later. Um, uh, but yeah, the general sort of principle of the sun heating the ground, ground heats air and the, and the warmer air rises. Um, is something that hopefully as glider pilots uh, we're generally uh, happy with and uh, as i say we could do a complete other presentation about thermal centering and, and stuff like that but uh, just having a good enough awareness of why a thermal sort of comes off the ground is probably uh, it's probably good enough and uh, hopefully come march we'll have uh, plenty of thermals to go flying in um and Obviously, convection doesn't always have to trigger clouds. Um, if the uh, if the atmosphere is not particularly humid, um, we might end up that uh, the clouds are not forming, or if there's an inversion in the way. Um, so, so yes, there's there's quite a lot to have to think about with advection and convection. But yeah, those two statements are worth remembering uh, because uh, you might get asked a question on that in the exam. And uh, I've sort of styled this a little bit for the PPL exams as well, because uh, as much as meteorology is maybe not quite as in detail, I think in the PPL syllabus, um, some of these definitions will come up. Check any questions at the moment. Okay. Solar heating and its effect on the wind. Um, well, we've just uh, learned about uh, 
sort of solar heating in general. Uh, but looking at what that might do to hills and stuff, when the sun shines on the slope during the day um, and in the morning, you'll get something known as a anabatic wind. Now, this anabatic wind is when the the sun warms the slope and the air becomes less dense and starts to rise. And you'll probably see this on sort of ridge lines and stuff like that. Um, certainly, the general rule of thumb is that uh, the first places to get thermals will be the more hilly, the more mountainous areas. That's where the thermals will start. And uh, for those clubs lucky enough to be based on a hill, a lucky you. Uh, uh, we sometimes have to wait for uh, a little bit long for that uh, for that air to be uh, uh, heated enough to start convecting. Um, but yeah, that air starts to cut the slope and um, it's probably a good idea to uh, always target places like uh, hills and stuff if you are looking for a thermal because they are, especially if they're slope facing, really, really good sources. But inversely, you get a uh, catabatic winds where as the air becomes more dense after the sun's gone away for the night, that air starts to come back down the slope and, um, and appears as a catabatic wind. If you have sort of a, a gliding club at the bottom of the hill and you're maybe flying uh, right at the end of the evening you would probably notice this a little bit more these winds sort of coming down the hill uh, uh, to affect as they as it happens so um i don't really think there's oh well, i mean dunstable um i get i guess maybe but um it's not a subtly facing hill but uh, yeah, just uh, just ideas on anabatic and catabatic winds. Uh, these do come up in the papers uh, every so often. So having an idea about them. Um, uh, Anne is up and Cat is down. Um, I don't, uh, it's, it's trying to find interesting, wonderful ways to remember how these things happen. OK, uh, just on each slide, I'm just checking the questions. Good, still none. Hey, uh, humidity and clouds. Um, it's often believed that sort of clouds are just made from water vapour, but there's a bit more detail to consider here because the amount of water vapour that's in there does, uh, in our atmosphere, does change quite a lot. And this is known as the relative humidity. And the relative humidity is sort of the comparison of how much air some, that parcel could take at a at that temperature. So colder air can take sort of um, can take less, uh, uh, can sort of take less, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, yeah, I've got, got my tongue twisted. Um, yeah, so co uh, colder air takes less to reach the dew point, uh, it can store sort of less moisture, um, as it says on here, and um, when that happens and you get to 100%, it gets to the point where you the dew point um, is reached and suddenly you're at a point where stuff stops starts condensing into a cloud. So you've got temperature and dew points. Um, and at the points where the air becomes 100% saturated is the dew point. So um, this is important because when we look at um, sort of dew point temperature splits when we go flying, we're generally in a glider looking for quite a big temperature dew point split because that hopefully means that we've that we're going to get a reasonably high cloud base. What we don't want to happen though is that the um is that the the actual parcel of air never actually becomes completely saturated the condenses because otherwise we never actually get those clouds and uh, you sort of get these blue days where potentially it's not particularly uh, any any good at all so uh, yes we always want it to reach a point where there at least is a bit of uh, condensing going on to uh, actually lead to a cloud being produced um, uh, but yes cooler air cannot hold as much water yeah, I should always uh, sort of uh, read my notes um, it might even be that uh, things are almost uh, going to ice crystals as well. And when we look at next week on sort of icing on the aeroplane, um, that will come quite important for why we don't fly through clouds. And uh, also remember there is a point in the atmosphere called the freezing level, and you can get that on the charts uh, that the Met Office provide, and they work out where that freezing level is. Obviously at this time of the year, the freezing level is quite low because the, the um, uh, uh, because it's cold, that polar, uh, 
uh, that polar line is, is south of us. So you might only have to get to a couple of thousand feet before uh, you get below freezing. And that's important, especially if you're carrying water ballast, because the water ballast might freeze, or if you fly through a cloud, you might ice up. Uh, whilst in the summer, we generally don't have to worry so much uh, about that. Um, I'll just go through the other bits of my notes that I've um, that I've got here. So generally, as air rises, it cools in most circumstances to a point that cold air can't hold as much water vapor as warm air. So it cool. So as the air cools, it more easily becomes saturation and condenses into a visible cloud. Now these clouds, when we look at them, are full of millions and millions of little water droplets uh, together. Perhaps just a hundredth of a millimeter that come together to create a cloud. And a cloud sometimes can be just almost or even more heavy than a jumbo jet. Uh, so uh, yeah, as much as they might look all flat. They are quite a uh, quite a mass. The main mechanism for cooling air is to force it to rise. As it rises, it encounters lower pressure, which means that the air also expands and somewhat, and the air cools. And generally, when we look at 100% humidity, it gets to a point where we might be looking at fog as well, quite prominent at this time of the year because uh, the, the air mass is completely saturated. Um, clouds as well. Um, when we look at clouds, we're looking at them from um, how much there is uh, in the sky. Um, so the octa scale uh, sort of just sort of shows how much cloud there might be in the sky. You'll generally see it worked out with sort of you know, an aviation forecast is few scatter broken overcast linked to these here. But you'll some, sometimes see in forecasts we talk about three eighths cumulus or something like that when we look at a soaring day, and that's probably about uh, the right amount of clouds that, that we want as such so uh, uh, so yes but the uh, uh, the oct scale is worth knowing because uh, when we come on to looking at a meter um, uh, you will be tested to know potentially how many octas of cloud there might be so that's just sort of a rote learning one which you'll probably need to uh, get your eye around um, once we get towards um, sort of it being foggy potentially you might not even be able to work out how much cloud there is so it becomes sky obscured uh, which is quite common when it's foggy so okay phone wind um probably i can't pronounce that right um um the phone effect is really a change from wet and cold conditions on the windward side to warmer and dry conditions on the leeward side. We might see this somewhere like uh, Scotland or maybe uh, the Pennines in the north of England, because as the air meets its sort of natural obstacles, such as a mountain, that air is forced to rise up. And as that air rises, it expands and cools due to the decreased pressure at altitude. As the air is colder and holds less moisture, that means that we start to get to a point where stuff starts to condense a bit more and we might even trigger some rain. And you can see here uh, on there that the precipitation sort of gets uh, kicked off here on the top of this large mountain. Um, on top of the mountain, there can be uh, bits of turbulence as well. Um, depending on the system, you might even get some mountain wave over the top if uh, in some conditions. Um, but the state, uh, the change of state from vapor to liquid, uh, does release a lot of heat energy uh, as this as this process happens, and that heat energy obviously starts, um, uh, and the rest of the air starts to come back down the slope onto the other side of the mountain, which provides some really sort of nice warm winds that we might see in places sort of like a Boyne in uh, in sort of the D side area of Scotland. It is therefore quite a big contrast. It's probably actually a reason why um, you will see less gliding in the western parts of Scotland. I think there was a club there at one point. Um, I think there might have been one on Oban or somewhere like that. Um, be really interested to hear about what gliding might have been like down there. But uh, yeah, the, effectively you've got wind going up the slope, and uh, and as the as the weather gets itself out up here, uh, the pressure will increase and the wind speed increases and temperature increases come back down the slope. And uh, this effect can be seen across across the world. And is uh, yeah, it's sort of lucky. I'd want to buy a house on this side. I would want to buy a house on the uh, on the other side of the mountain. Right. Okay. So so far, and we've looked at lots of different things. We're going to look at a few more pictures now because we're going to look at clouds. Um, so so low level clouds 
uh, start off with stratus lots and lots of moisture generally not a good cloud for gliding um uh, generally means that uh, there's probably gonna be showers and spits of um bits of sort of drizzle etc and stuff like that so yeah we wouldn't really want to be seeing too much of stratus clouds it may also be um linked up to hill fog as well so yeah stratus cloud strata cumulus uh, which is normally made up uh, some, some sort of clouds stratus clouds that sort of break up maybe cumulus which is sort of come a little bit overdeveloped um so stratocumulus is soarable as well you can get a thermal under under it unlike stratus which you wouldn't normally be able to see it um but uh but yes we don't generally like seeing stratocumulus because it generally means that uh, the sun's not going to get quite through uh, to the same level as we want it to uh but yeah it's still made up from uh, quite a lot of trapped moisture maybe below an inversion is of course our favorite cloud the cumulus uh, don't need to say too much about that uh, but yeah cumulus clouds cumulonimbus clouds which is when um cumulus clouds start to get a little bit out of control when sort of the heating element continues and the top of the clouds keep rising and rising and rising uh, unopposed as such and you start to get thunderstorms out of that more on that next week and nimbostratus clouds um that uh, generally bring rain <clears throat> and uh, we might generally see them um, when it comes to fronts with um uh, with these sort of clouds um they are actually named after sort of the latin um of these uh, these elements so sort of stratus generally meaning layer cumulus meaning heap and nimbo meaning um uh, nimbo meaning rain so if you sort of Think of all of this in latin you can see how they've sort of got their names because they've just stuck them all together but yeah those are the low level clouds generally below about six to seven thousand feet medium level clouds uh, sort of outer stratus outer cumulus and sometimes lenticular though lenticular can fit into other categories as well um outer stratus um generally forms um when you've got sort of moisture which is trapped at a much much higher level uh, a bit like it's it's sort of stratus friend it doesn't generally bring too much rain um with it but uh, it does sort of uh, sort of block the sun out and it might be a sign that uh, uh, maybe a, a warm front's coming and we'll look at those signs um outer cumulus on the other hand uh, can form in several ways such as sort of outer stratus breaking up as the sun gets a little bit more powerful um sort of gentle convection maybe at higher levels maybe even a bit of mountain wave getting in the way but outer cumulus on its own is generally a little bit rarer compared to the sort of outer cumulus castellanus um, clouds where you've sort of got outer cumulus which uh, is effectively towering up like a uh, like a towering cumulus where you've got more vertical development in the cloud that will generally mean that we're starting to head towards thunderstorm territory and although on a um, on a summer's day uh, it might seem more bright and sunny if you start seeing these quite tall what appear to be cumulus clouds high up and um, that's not a good sign uh, it does mean that thunderstorms are likely as it shows there's a lot of instability at height um i'd be interested to know if anybody's ever managed to actually saw any outer cumulus um because the idea of convection of the sun heating the ground and and getting thermals from that does isn't quite working with uh, outer cumulus because actually there's it's just up at air which is unstable naturally it's not working just off the ground so although you might fly to a cloud which is maybe at 10,000 feet and you think wow that looks really really good it's actually not any anything useful at all really to us um, but uh, yeah unless maybe it, you're flying in somewhere like Namibia and you're getting uh, cumulus up to 20,000 feet and then maybe it is but, uh, but yes um, as we look at lenticular uh, we'll look into wave a little bit more um but so uh, yeah that's just a bit of a taster for later lenticular clouds also do feature finally high level clouds cirrus cirrus stratus cirro cumulus uh, these clouds only form from the center dry air really really high up making a small quantity of water vapor in the air undergo a sort of a more uh, ice formation up at height and cirrus really uh, that's all that's made up of uh, this is all generally about flight level 200 if not even higher um, 
Cirrocumulus might show some really, really instability at height and it's actually quite rare in the UK. But also contrails in the human effect play their part as well because uh, sort of as a contrail spreads out, it sort of mixes some of that moisture, mixes with some of the other clouds and you can get some quite interesting formations. And um, I don't have any photos on here, but it's quite interesting to see when uh, when that happens and you get contrails that sort of hang around in the morning when the, uh, the upper levels are, are fairly moist. Unusual clouds. Let's put a couple on here. Um, let's pronounce this Kelvin Helmholtz cloud. Um, I've seen this a couple of times in the glider and they sort of occur when there's two different layers in the air which are moving at different speeds and sort of the clouds come up and it's sort of been caught, so the top of the clouds been caught by that, um, that maybe slightly stronger or slightly different direction wind. And that's sort of a basic idea of why that happens. And it looks like sort of a um, sort of a surf down in Australia or a tidal wave sort of coming your way. But um, people say that they're really unusual, but they do happen sort of. I've, I've seen them more and more in the UK, at least in the last uh, couple of years. It might be that I just fly a little bit too regularly just, uh, and I'm seeing them a lot. But I do see them a couple of times a year. So they're not something which is certainly impossible to see. I'd say at least a glider pilot would see one a couple of times um over a decade or so uh, when flying so yeah really interesting uh, to sometimes see these uh, when you're packing up for the day um it does make you wonder what's going on up there and mammoth clouds um are sort of caused by lots of very uh, strong powerful rising and sinking air in a thunderstorm um generally if you see this it means you've really found a really nasty thunderstorm i think i saw one of these um in the uk at the end of last august after a, a nasty nasty school line which uh, brought about 50 to 60 knot winds to lash and thankfully uh, nothing took off during that time but so uh, yeah mammoth clouds are very interesting shapes certainly in any airplane keep away okay Moving on to another section now, we are getting through as best as we can at the moment. Air masses. Air masses are bodies of air, sort of large volumes of air, um, covering a very large area uh, over the country, or maybe several countries, where the temperature, lapse rates and humidity characteristics are very, very similar, almost uniform. They're sort of classified according to the region where they originate and the track that they follow over the Earth's surface. And we're going to just look at the UK ones here. Um, they will be moving quite a lot of the time because there's nothing static. They're, the air masses are going to get changed around by fronts and uh, and sort of the jet stream and stuff. And each air mass does something um, different to the weather, something that some things that might benefit gliding and some things that might not. And air masses can be, as I said, very sort of broad and over an entire country. But air masses can also be quite localised when we look at things like sea breeze fronts and, and stuff, because that might only affect a small corner of the country, but it is still sort of a change of air mass that we're getting because it's going to change what the soaring's like. Um, uh, but uh, yes, I think we're definitely in a very westerly air mass at the moment, but I'll bring up the screen because Met Office have all the scientific definitions. Um, we will be in at the moment. Um, in fact, we did get a little bit of snow. We, we're probably... Um, we're probably in a returning polar maritime at the moment. It's not or, or polar maritime. We're not particularly. Uh, we're we're not particularly too um, snowy at the moment. Um, earlier in the week, we did uh, sort of get a blast from the southwest when uh, I think temperatures got up to sort of twelve to thirteen degrees, which felt positively balmy uh, for us then. Um, but these air masses are really the predominant controllers of the UK weather and can really make or break a day. Uh, the general properties of an air mass may be deduced from the source uh, of it. So one like a tropical continental air mass might generally bring uh, stuff in from the European continent. Uh, it's generally hot and dry, but Along with that, uh, it generally picks up all of the sort of dust and dirt that comes off the continent and it brings it over the channel because it's not particularly that big. And that's when we see sort of poorer weather conditions uh, for sort of visibility. If you get sort of a blocking air where the air is all sinking and all that air sinking and you get sort of chucked underneath it, uh, some sort of dust 
and sort of uh, and smoke and stuff from factories in northern France as well. That is really when you get some really poor visibility and it might be only four or five kilometres, despite it being a beautiful summer's day. And especially up at cloud base on a day like then, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it really is uh, a bit of a dangerous territory to be because you cannot see things particularly nice and you can't actually see where your next cloud is either. It's going to be really, really um, uh, sort of difficult to sort of work out which one to go to. Thunderstorms can also be hidden quite easily in a tropical continental air mass because, again, visibility is decreased. You might see the top of a thunderstorm way above um, in the distance. But so yeah, tropical continental air masses are a little bit uh, of a pain. Polar continental, though, probably known better as sort of beast from the east uh, when we uh, when it works um, uh, for us. Um, generally brings the snowy weather because you've got sort of the Atlantic fronts which come across from the west and if you've got an air mass coming in from uh, uh, from sort of Russia and Scandinavia and it sort of meets in the middle that's when you start to get um, that, that, those sort of snowy conditions as the Atlantic fronts run into that colder air causing snow uh, and uh, snow at, at lower levels is generally possible anything from sort of three degrees or less um, and we'll come on to the more interesting things like freezing rain next week. But um, yeah, constant layer mass, uh, something to be aware of. Um, Arctic maritime, sort of wet and cold air that brings snow in the winter, not quite as bad as the polar continental. But yeah, you can see quite a lot on there um, and uh, worth having a, uh, a bit more delve into this and, and sort of work out day to day what sort of air mass you are in. And these, these sort of fronts do have some boundaries and uh, not fronts uh, air masses do have some boundaries and depending on sort of what um sort of air mass you've got depends on sort of what slants the um the the angle is so um each each air mass has got its own density and properties so uh, as one arrives it will do something slightly differently and you might see a more marked transition from one to the other hence we say the, the um the polar uh, continental is really really noticeable compared to some of the other uh, so some of the other ones that you might get but uh, yeah so yeah boundaries between the air masses uh, are something to keep an eye on right okay uh, we are getting there we're slide 29 at the moment i know it's sort of a long haul that you can see why i've had to split this one down okay synoptic charts and fronts effectively a synoptic chart or a synopsis is any map that summarizes atmospheric conditions over a wide area at a point of time and every country will and meteorology organization will do a forecast for that it features a lot of information isobars frontal systems and more um we spoke about isobars we're going to look at fronts in in literally just a moment uh, the synopsis is to check in if that's still working. Um, yeah, the the synopsis um, is really the sort of bread and butter of how to forecast weather uh, initially, because uh, you can have all the fancy apps, you can have all the predictions and stuff, but just looking at a a box standard uh, sort of synoptic chart will enable you to see what weather is coming your way and what a front really is is a boundary between the two air masses so if we look here um let's say you've sort of got sort of um uh, cold air which is sort of coming from the um uh, uh from sort of a polar continental continental here as this warm front sort of makes its way in and if it wins you'll start to sort of see an increase in temperature here the cold front behind it will eventually catch up and will bring colder air behind it so um so yeah the the red lines and the blue lines is sort of the dividing point um, of the front and uh, sort of behind it is the conditions which you can sort of see uh, on here. So, yeah, it will warm up behind it in front of it. So making sure you've got your triangles and uh, semicircles the right way around. Um, they the, all of these fronts produce really changeable climates um such as the ones we've got in the uk but actually not every climate actually relies on the fronts because in australia for example you'll get sort of less in the way 
uh, of cold fronts and stuff in the middle because it's, it's it's very stable but you'll get just get more of slight reductions in pressures known as troughs which will uh, which will influence just as much and cause rain and stuff like that so although it's very predominant in this country that the fronts are the driving thing it's not the same everywhere and uh, yeah take take that uh, into account if you are going to fly overseas at all so thinking back to jet streams and the polar front and you can see on here uh, where the air mass is in equilibrium if the frontal boundary gets disturbed a slight wave will start to uh, form this causes the warmer air to begin circulating towards the north and the cooler air will get pulled around to the south and that cooler air uh, will circulate to the south to replace the warmer air. There is a pocket of warm air in the middle called the frontal boundary because less dense air has replaced more dense cool air in this pocket. This region becomes the centre of the developing low pressure system. Now the actual intensity of a low really depends um, on how much energy is being pulled into this. A depression, a real bad depression where you're getting sort of 940 hectopascals and stuff like that um, uh, can be really really quite intense as we looked at pressure gradients earlier with a very 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 tight isobars close to the uh, 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 close to the center um, yeah you can get um, you can get very strong winds but uh, but generally when we're talking about just a normal front um, it will sort of form like this and you'll eventually get to a point where you've got uh, sort of a very characteristic sort of uh, uh, warm and cold front. Sort of the development of frontal systems doesn't get tested in the exam but it's it's sort of a nice to know and just to sort of see how it starts. A picture speaks sort of a thousand words on this one. Um, so you occasionally hear something called weather bomb as the Daily Express likes to call it. A weather bomb is effectively where the pressure drops very very quickly um, as the uh, as the low continues to form uh, effectively that's when a uh, an event happens where things sort of uh, deteriorate um, 24 hectopascals in, in a day or so so uh, you can imagine a hectopascal per hour it's quite a lot really in in our terms so uh, yeah you wouldn't really want to be faced with that while flying but uh, yep you've got uh, quite a lot to look at there and as I say a bit more head in the book uh, on this one uh, because uh, there is quite a lot of interesting science at work okay and every front is active in the sense that any difference between the two air masses will always create sort of weather along these sort of interfaces that you can see here the results can be dramatic when the two air masses are markedly different, hence I spoke about uh, snow. And then you get sometimes when actually the air masses are very similar and these fronts are actually quite weak and actually the, all it brings is cloud. So um, a warm front on a chart is, is sort of a general idea rather than you're definitely going to get a, a hurricane or you're de definitely going to get something really nasty. Of course, hurricanes do not occur in the UK because of the fact of our quite low temperature uh, low temperature seas um but uh, it's not unusual for example for an approaching cold front to be sort of slow to a snail's pace by a by quite a uh, large area of high pressure so if the high pressure sort of comes in and blocks this front coming through it can actually get completely destroyed in total even though it's gone through all that process and the sort of bother of forming itself if it comes up to high pressure you might actually find that the uh, it doesn't get through in the end and it just quietly dissipates a major problem really is, is just working out when these are going to arrive and the exact track and stuff like that and you can sort of probably start to see that forecasting might look easy for the uh, for the people on tv but the computers and the people um, back at the met office next to are really having to work quite hard to work out where these things are going to arrive that's why we can never work out what's going to happen next um warm fronts will generally have a a slightly more gradual slope than uh, than cold fronts. We're going to come on to the particulars of both fronts in a moment. Um, so the a, 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 a cold front or a warm front can sort of extend for hundreds and hundreds of miles and uh, generally the closer you are to the low the more severe the conditions will be or the closer you are to the area of the sort of strongest pressure gradient. Um, the cold fronts are generally more uh, aggressive than the warm fronts and will catch up eventually. Uh, we'll come on to that shortly. Um, 
uh, so, and generally as, as, it, as it's coming forward at a rate of knots, the, uh, the slope of interface is far steeper than that of a warm front as, the, uh, as it leans backwards over the cold sort of intruding air that's, that's coming in, driving under a, sort of a wedge that's coming. So, um, yeah, the, the frontal systems will generally start off just a little bit stronger, a bit higher up. Um, rather than uh, at the lower at the at the lower levels, and as we now look at the warm front, effectively uh, a warm front is when the warm air is advancing, rising over the sitting cold air, as the warm air is lighter and less dense than the cold air. For glider pilots, soaring is often poor in this warm sector between the leading warm front and the trailing cold one. So behind what well, a warm sector is effectively when you've got the, the, the front's passed and um, uh, and you're waiting now for the cold front or whatever uh, to, to come your way. Um, generally, as the warm front comes through, um, there'll be some precipitation, uh, low cloud of mist, the pressure falls and then starts to rise as it passes and variable winds at the front, but generally south to southwest after it. Um, but yes, warm sectors, um, you might be able to go flying in them, depending if the cloud base is high enough, but it's generally not particularly good for soaring. We're generally more interested in the cold front coming through for that. And if I show you onto the uh, next one, um, sort of a cross section of that warm front, you can sort of see how it starts off. Um, as that um, as the warm air approaches, you'll see cirrus higher up. The first level of moisture is that that sort of wedge starts to make its way in. And that cirrus will generally start getting thicker and thicker, uh, then sort of taken over by the cirrus stratus, outer stratus, and then eventually as the front arrives, nimbo stratus, um, just, just general rain and stuff. Afterwards, because warm front is quite a moist air, uh, quite a moist occurrence, you'll get quite a lot of strata cumulus afterwards. And as I say, partic not particularly good soaring conditions. Um, you'll see that cumulus in the cold air uh, will continue to sort of uh, continue to form as much as it can until sort of the sunlight starts to cut off by the uh, by these high levels of cloud. So, uh, yeah. Cross section of warm front looks a bit like that, as I said, starts with the cirrus, down to the cirrus stratus, outer stratus, nimbus stratus, and the, uh, the cumulus will keep sort of forming underneath um, until the point that the sun eventually gets cut off. I'm going to keep checking that we are working. Okay. Um, good. Okay. Right. We're back in business. We're back in business. Okay. Cold fronts. Um, <laughs> OK, cold air uh, sort of pushes underneath the warmer air at the surface, uh, forcing that air to rise as, as the cold air is denser than the warm air. That's sort of identified as triangles on the charts, and it brings a short spell of heavy rainfall and squally winds. Lots of cloud in the warm air ahead of the cold front. Pressure rises throughout the approach of the passage and the wind will be shifting through the power to the front. Wind after the passage of the front will be more of a northwesterly influence for the UK. Um, so, yeah, you can sort of see that sort of that warm air getting forced up by the cold air. And uh, for us, for soaring, this can be uh, good to an extent. Um, if the cold front is particularly nasty, though, you might end up being um, uh, uh, being sort of hit by thunderstorms and stuff like that. So here's a sort of an effect of a cold front being on its way. You can sort of see that warm air being forced up. I'm just going to check you guys are still seeing stuff. Excellent. You are. Um, so yeah that warm air is forced up and generally uh, it will just keep rising and rising and rising and will cause uh, big thunderstorms to uh, form and that cold air will be kept underneath as it comes through generally this is the best this is the better sort of weather we're interested in because once that cold front's gone through you can see these cumulus clouds forming because it's nice and uh, unstable so uh, so yes uh, that's what we like for a good gliding day and uh, but Generally, we don't like the, uh, the thunderstorm side of it because it means we have to hide. <laughs> OK, a couple of just graphics here. I'm just going to spend only a couple of minutes on them. This was an example of a cold front just a couple of weeks ago uh, that was sort of shared quite widely on the Internet. Um, 20th of January, before we got all that snow, you can sort of see how Wales was sort of one or two degrees as well as often is. And literally just the other side, maybe 150, 200 miles east, it was it was still nine or 10 degrees. So this was quite a sharp cold front. And this is why I say the intensity of these fronts really does make the difference. 
you can see also how much the wind changed as well um and just a bit of a shout out for liam dutton who is an absolutely fantastic meteorologist at channel four um a lot of meteorologists on the tv actually have are not necessarily anything more than a weather presenter whilst people you get like liam absolutely know what they're talking about and if if uh, uh, if liam could have presented tonight a he probably would have got the slides working but b uh, he could have gone into probably a much much better detail so i can only aspire to be something uh, like liam but um but yes he uh, he puts out a lot of interesting tweets and stuff like that on weather and you can learn quite a lot with this also i'm not being paid by this by the way um very British weather, really good book by the Met Office, has helped me produce some of tonight's, tonight's content, so, so yes. But uh, yeah, you can sort of see the cold and the mild air and just how sort of that that line exists. And if you put it onto uh, a weather map, you can sort of see how sort of dramatic this was. And because it was quite a severe front, you got quite a lot of rain. An occlusion though, um, does sometimes happen because this cold front is generally moving faster than warm uh, warm fronts because the air is denser and if that warm front uh, that a cold front can catch up with the warm front it becomes an occlusion um an occlusion effectively is just sort of a not somewhat of a mix of the two fronts um but sort of more more like i'd say the cold front is than than the than the uh than the warm front um the point of occlusion uh, is called also called a triple point and in that triple point you do generally get some uh, potentially more interesting weather where potentially you've got sort of more chance of thunderstorms or convective activity and in an occlusion they'll always generally end up polewards uh, because the front can't be the other way around due to the Coriolis effect so uh, so yes so uh, yeah occlusions very interesting and you can sort of see how that works on the graphics Ridges and troughs. Um, ridges are elongated areas of high pressure. Um, they bring similar weather uh, to that associated with uh, anticyclones. Good soaring is likely uh, with a ridge, and this is where the old saying, the calm before the storm comes, because quite often there's a ridge of high pressure just before a, a low comes to swipe everything else. Um, and um, and yeah, so uh, as this uh, as the ridge comes through, um, that will generally uh, sort of mean that you get slightly higher pressure. That generally promotes soaring, and um, and better conditions for clouds as well, because you don't want really too much of a high pressure, because that's what that sinking air does generally sort of squish the clouds. Um, Troughs, on the other hand, are the opposite to the elongated areas of low pressure. They bring similar weather to that associated with, associated with depressions. And a deep trough is something that will bring some particularly nasty weather, uh, thunderstorms, gust fronts, uh, heavy rain and convective activity. So, yeah, it's um, troughs are the ones to watch. Highs are the uh, and ridges are the ones we really want to make advantage of. And the best soaring days are just after that cold front's gone through as the ridge of high pressure comes in because the air is perfectly unstable enough um, in the middle of june that's the day you're going to get a thousand kilometers nearly there now folks coals convergences and waving weather fronts uh, coal is basically an area of slack pressure between two high pressure systems and maybe some low pressure systems and it's basically an area of nothingness there's not particularly too much of anything it's a bit boring um not particularly much wind and the wind may be variable as well by variable i mean it's going in any direction generally if it's less than five knots it's counted as variable a waving weather front um is something that unfortunately we see occasionally in the uk which is where a front sort of gets stuck um where potentially the jet stream is moving in a certain direction or it's trying to move but it, it sort of just plagues us by sitting in one position or or if or if a front line moves north and it stalls and it comes back the other way especially in sort of the center of a low you'll find that the the weather is a bit like a washing machine you just get the same weather a million times but so uh, yeah with the waving weather fronts uh, you'll end up quite often that um you'll get long periods of wet weather which uh, really doesn't help us at all uh because uh, if it's stuck there you could be 100 miles north and you'll be absolutely perfectly fine flying and uh, 100 miles south under, under this stuff you could be trapped there for days 
More interesting are those convergence lines. Uh, the maths office don't really talk about them particularly much because their definition of a convergence line is a bit different to ours. Effectively, a convergence line is where the sort of two air masses meet. And at that point, if the air masses sort of stagnate and don't give way, what the Met Office sort of says it's an area where you're going to get a particularly lo a large amount of rain, which is sort of stationary. Um, for us, the convergence line, we're more interested in it just before it's got to that stage of being mature enough to to do something like that. So, um, and convergence lines can set up across the country normally on uh, on sort of fairly breezy days. Um, that 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 can happen and with the convergence um if it's on a chart it generally means it's not so good for gliding uh, because it means it's more likely to rain and you'll see the sort of spiky thing that gets put on the chart i get quite like it and point out forecasts when we do that so uh, yeah just checking we're good okay good okay but yes convergence is waving weather fronts and coals sea breeze and land breeze fronts Uh, generally caused by the differences in the the seas occur during the day when the land area heats more rapidly than the water's surface. This results in pressure of the land being lower than that of the water, and that picks up the air off the um, off the uh, air off the sea and chucks it inland. Um, and if the pressure gradient is particularly strong, it means that uh, there's quite a lot of energy for it to go quite far inland. I've seen this in Australia where it's gone in about 100 kilometres inland. Um, the Australians said that that wasn't uh, that that can't ever happen, but I'm, I'm just dubious of what else it might might be. It, it could just be a maritime air mass or something, but it's generally the same principle because it stops being soarable. Um, it's potentially um, can mean that you get some offshore fog coming on as well or the har as they call it up north and is effectively a change of local air mass for us in gliding this kills soaring and can alter the surface wind and strength that's something that comes up in bronze exams frequently what does a sea breeze front do so if you've got let's say lashem in the south as the sea breeze front approaches you'll see that the soaring gets really really good all of a sudden you'll get sort of cumulus of this sort of hanging cloud and as the sea breeze front comes through, what it will do is the wind direction will start generally to back uh, lashing. It does if we're on a light westerly or back to a southerly, or the wind will come, start coming from the sea. Temperature will reduce, wind strength will increase and the soaring, most importantly, will switch off. So that's quite, if there's anything to take away, that's one of the ones because I know they keep asking questions on that. So, yeah, land breeze is the opposite of a... Um, of uh, of the sea breeze because at the end of the day the reverse happens that air goes back out to sea as i said a bit linked to sort of derunal variation uh, because the land cools off fast in the ocean due to differences in heat capacity which forces the dying daytime sea okay last two slides now um mountain wave um best to look at g dale's lecture on this for more uh, but mountain waves can really occur in the following conditions wind direction within 30 degrees of perpendicular to the ridge or high ground as long as as it goes up that direction is not changing too much you can start to get um, a change uh, into mountain wave the wind speed needs to sort of start to slowly increase as well but needs to be strong enough that the mountains are having some effect and the air needs to be relatively stable and stability will come to next week. Um, I appreciate not there'll be a few concepts which have been brought up in this lecture, which might not make sense yet, but we'll try and make sense of them next week. Um, this can happen completely blue without moisture um, and it can be invisible, makes it a bit tricky, but um, it produces those lovely, uh, those lovely clouds known as lenticular clouds. And uh, they sort of form at sort of right angles uh, to the wind and sort of the effectiveness of wave is is that air flows across a mountain range and it usually rises smoothly at the slope of the range but once over the top it pours down the other side of a considerable force bouncing up and down creating turbulence and also powerful vertical waves as it hits the floor and bounces back up again uh, and that can ex go for many many miles down wind here at Lashen we get uh, it's at um uh we get wave off the uh off off the Welsh Hills, for example, but we also can get other wave caused by fronts. So I'm not going to go into that tonight because that's quite complex. There is rotor at the bottom of this wave where uh, stuff close to the ground at the bottom of the hill 
or at the bottom of the wave system and it might get mixed in with thermals too and you get some fantastic thermals but fantastic sink as well and it's it's very very rough indeed you want the straps on tight for that um for a power pilot you won't really want to to uh, get in the way of the wave system unless you really have to and in any case you'll probably want to fly sort of at an angle to the ridge because if you get caught in a updraft or downdraft downdraft especially you're not going to have a particularly nice day trying to get out of that especially in something like a Cessna 150 which is a bit underpowered because sink rates and climb rates can sort of um, vary by maybe 1500 2000 feet a minute in either direction so uh, yeah but uh, lee wave uh, sort of nearer hills but can sort of go across the country uh, but youtube lecture by gdo explains this far better than i have uh, being a flatland pilot i don't have particularly much experience of wave and finally just bringing it all back together with just some pictures of uh, synoptic charts you can sort of see all these different things that we've been talking about are finally all being brought together let's check that we i'm still sharing Isle of White Wave, yeah, that's good. Thanks, uh, Mr. Fish. Um, um, Carl, and just for information, you'll sort of see all these sort of lines and, and stuff, stationary fronts or wheeling weather fronts will look something like that. Warm fronts, cold fronts, we know, occluded fronts, dry lines. These upper level fronts are where you get these sort of, you'll sometimes see on the charts something like a, a, a an unshaded sort of triangle or something that's effectively where there's a front higher up but it's not really affecting so much of the surface generally with that we would just expect there to be a bit of cloud if there's sort of dotted lines and stuff that might mean it's dissipating if there's no lines it might mean it's forming and um that's doing the same for warm and uh cold fronts okay so right okay just a brief check of understanding i'll just give you a couple of questions to have a play with um, but uh, and then you can ask me any more questions. I appreciate this has run a little bit longer due to technological failures. I thought I had this all set up properly. Um, right, three questions there. I just want you to have a look and just see what you have to think. And uh, in a minute, minute or so's time, I'll give you the answers. don't put the answers in do not put the answers in the chat please because <laughs> otherwise nobody will it will really annoy people okay okay give you another 30 seconds and we'll I'll do it. And then we'll finish up just in time, about 15 minutes late, I apologise. Okay, we can still see that. Okay, let's go through these then. Okay, what's the first sign of an approaching forefront front in the summer months? B. High level clouds slowly approaching with weakening soaring conditions. These are taken out the bronze confuser, by the way, for any other CFIs thinking I've uh, maybe taken it out somewhere else. Um, <laughs> the next question, um, as we just discussed, um, a, uh, a sea breeze front has to be forecast to penetrate in inland beyond one of your chosen turning points. Assuming this takes place before you get there, uh, what would be expected by the conditions you approach the turn point? Well, as the turn point is in the sea breeze fronts, that means that the um, you'll probably get really, really good uh, soaring just before you turn it, you'll head off into the, the turn point and there will be no thermals, which is not particularly good. And finally, I've probably banged on about this enough today, but um, what be an indication of strong wind on a weather chart is ice bars close together, indicating a steep pressure gradient. OK, hopefully that sort of made sense. As Lucy asked me to do, um, just going to give a shout out to the uh, rest of the events going on um, I hear The Condor Championships is going quite uh, uh, quite fun. It'd be a bit of a bus holiday for me, but I probably will have to get get into it if this lockdown goes on for much longer. I'll talk tomorrow by Alex Harris, who hopefully won't have any technology issues like me um, uh, on aerobatics. Uh, that's at 8 p.m. tomorrow, and I'm back next week on Saturday the 6th at 7, and then we've got the UK Judy Gliding Quiz 2 at 8 p.m. on Zoom on the 20th. 
Right, we've got there. I apologise, it's been that, that long. I probably lose my voice, but I will get it back by next week. I will get it back by next week. If you do have any questions, I'll probably have to look at my book. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, really sorry that we lost a little bit of that. But yes, thanks, Steve. I will go get a beer now because <laughs> I didn't drink any of the water. But... but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but yes, I'll be back next week, Saturday the 6th, to have a look. Uh, yes, Tom, I noticed that. That was my fault. <laughs> But yes, I'll make sure that for Lash members, we've got all of this ready. But uh, other than that, other than that, uh, if I, uh, well, I hope to see most of you for part two. If for some reason, 50 of you don't turn up, I'll presume you didn't like the technology issues. But um, um hope you are all uh, doing well considering the lockdown. Do make sure that your CFIs are actually making sure you can do online exams there's no real excuse for you cfis out there it's possible to do the bjs made made it happen so please please um i do that and thanks frank for that um, it'd be good good i know keith mcintyre so. <laughs> so, so yeah but cfis out there please make sure that you are um that you're using the uh resources we've got when we this be on YouTube a couple of days time. I'm going to need to edit a little bit of this because um, of the slight technology issue. And I think um, unless there's any further questions, you can leave it to next week. I'll try. I'm, I'm not going to delete this slide, but uh, I will bid you a good night here from Hampshire.